Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from, and a warm welcome to all. You have joined the introductory session for Module 9 on social media, in which you'll hear from two museum professionals representing small museums who have learned to harness the power of social media for their sites. This module is brought to you by the Digital Empowerment for Small Museums Project, a nationwide initiative organized by the six U.S. regional museum associations and dedicated to providing free self-paced training resources for small museums. This inaugural series of online trainings and resource toolkits focused on digital media and technology topics is made possible by funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. My name is Zinnia Willits, and I am the Executive Director of the Southeastern Museums Conference. My pronouns are she, her. I am a light-skinned white female with shoulder-length reddish-brown hair. I am wearing black-rimmed glasses that are often referred to as cat-eye style, and today I'm wearing a navy blue turtleneck and I'm sitting in front of a backdrop of my home office, which consists of a desk and a few computers behind me. As the host for today's session, I would like to convey a few things to our attendees before we begin the program. In this era of virtual meetings, when digital spaces may substitute our physical sense of place, it is important to reflect on the land we each occupy and honor the indigenous people who have called it home. Today, I'm speaking to you from Charleston, South Carolina, the historical homelands of the Natchez Cuso peoples. Wherever we are, let us acknowledge all indigenous nations as living communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We, the Digital Empowerment Project for Small Museums team, recognize that our organizations and those of our members were founded within a colonizing society that perpetuated the exclusions and erasures of many Native peoples throughout the United States and beyond. We ask you to reflect on the place where you reside and work and to respect the diversity of cultures and experiences that form the richness of our world and our profession. Thank you. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenters, Melissa Kivit and Emily Stone. Our first presenter, Melissa Kivit, is the Director of Development and Community Engagement at the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum Alliance. She earned her bachelor's degree in history from Maryville College in Maryville, Tennessee, and is a graduate of the Cooperstown Graduate Program and earned her master's degree in museum studies. She has worked in various development departments in the arts and culture sector prior to her current position and serves on the diversity task force for the Maryville College Alumni Board. Emily Stone will be our second presenter. As a naturalist, Emily teaches kids of all ages about nature in beautiful places. She earned a degree in outdoor education and natural history from Northland College and an MS in the Field Naturalist Program at the University of Vermont. As the natural, naturalist and education director at the Cable Natural History Museum in Cable, Wisconsin, Emily coordinates school programs, public programs, exhibit development, and more. As part of the museum's outreach, Emily writes an award-winning natu Natural Connections column for more than 20 newspapers across three states. Her second Natural Connections book won an Excellence in Craft Award from the Outdoor Writers Association of America. I have enjoyed getting to know both Emily and Melissa, and I'm thankful for the time they have devoted to this session. Now I am pleased to turn the floor over to Melissa Kiwi to begin our session. Thank you, Zinnia. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Melissa Kivi, Director of Development and Community Engagement at the Dykeman Farm House Museum. I use she, her pronouns. Thank you for attending today. Today, I hope to give you some insight into how an inc my incredibly small institution has grown its social media following on a super tight budget. I would like to let you know ahead of time that during this presentation, I will be describing the slides as they appear in order to assist anyone who may be visually impaired. This slide has a photo of me, a white woman with brown hair, wearing a white sweater, and it describes my credentials, a Bachelor of Arts in Histories, uh, a Master of Arts in Museum Studies, and Director of Development and Community Engagement at the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum for the last four years. 
to start, I'm going to give a brief background on who I am and how I came to manage the social media for the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum. This slide includes a picture of me wearing a black t-shirt with five names of ensla enslaved and freed people whose labor made the farm prosper. Hannah, Gilbert, Francis, Harry, and Will. It also lists a few of my daily duties at the museum, community engagement, fundraising, managing volunteers and interns, collections care, landscape garden management, and operations management, to name a few. As you might have noticed from my credentials on the last slide, I do not have a background in marketing or digital media. I have a master in museum studies and a lot of experience on Googling uh, how to do things that I did not go to school for. As you can see by this slide, I wear a lot of hats at the museum. Our staff size is three full-time staff, an executive director, an educator, and myself, and one part-time staff who works on research and helping me with digital humanities projects and social media. This means that I have a lot of things to do and social media does not always take priority. I will talk a bit about how I manage that, but first I wanna let you know what subject I plan to cover today. This next slide is on a back background and shows an overview of the topics to be discussed over the next 15 minutes. I'm going to give you some background on the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum so that you have an understanding of what the museum is trying to accomplish through its social media channels. I will discuss how I went from using only private social media accounts to successfully running a business account, which is very difficult and a little intimidating if I'm being honest. Then we will discuss my favorite community engagement tool to date, Luna. And finally, we will discuss how DFM has kept up with change and how we have built a network to support continued social media engagement. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to share the museum's acknowledgement of land. This slide is a back black ground with these exact words. The Dykeman Farmhouse Museum recognizes and acknowledges the land on which the farmhouse stands. Dutch colonists removed the Muncie Lenape people from unceded land not far from Fort Tryon Park, where tribal groups lived until the late 17th century. Muncie Lenape people are still alive today. We are also on land that enslaved African, Africans worked to better the lives of local Dutch farmers. These men and women built much of this country under brutal conditions without pay or acknowledgement. We named the original stewards of this land as a way to recognize the complete history of our nation, both the harm of colonization and the potential for repair. On this slide, I'm sharing a very brief timeline of the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum with a picture of the farmhouse in black and white taken in the mid 1960s to highlight the famous Dutch gable roof line. The farmhouse was built in 1784 in what is now Upper Manhattan, but then was very rural farmland. At its peak, the Dykemans owned approximately 250 acres of farm, farmland. The neighborhood was not developed until the 1920s and 30s. Heading way back to the 1660s, the first ancestor of today's farmhouse arrived and settled in Harlem. With partnership with a friend and neighbor, they took over today's Inwood and turned it into farmland for themselves and to sell off to other arriving European families. During the American Revolution, the Dykeman family fled upstate as British troops took over Upper Manhattan. When they returned at the end of the war, the original homestead was destroyed. The family built the current home uh, as it stands today in 1784 and continued to farm on 250 acres of land with the use of enslaved labor. The farm continued to be inherited by the Dykeman family members until about the 1860s. With growing population of Manhattan, farming was becoming less desirable as urbanization crept uh, up northward to upper Manhattan. The family tried selling the farm in 1871 it, in, in 1871, it officially left Dykeman ownership. 
It wasn't until the early 1900s that urbanization and the arrival of the subway system severely threatened the survival of the farmhouse. Descendants of the last Dykeman owners of the farmhouse, sisters Mary Alice Dykeman Dean and Fanny Frederica Dykeman Welch, bought back the home in 1915 to preserve it. The sisters donated the home to the city of New York in 1916 to be opened as a museum. The home fell to disarray in the past decades, so renovations and redesign brought it back to the way the farmhouse is presented today. The Dykeman Farmhouse Museum has now been a museum for over 100 years, as well as obtain, obtaining national and New York City landmark status in 1967. Now for the fun part, the community we serve. Pictured here is a map of Upper Manhattan labeled Little Dominican Republic and several images of our community members on the grounds of the farmhouse. Community members include indigenous, Dominican, black and white representation. Today, the farmhouse is located in a very busy neighborhood that is divided by Broadway, the road that the farmhouse sits on. East of Broadway is traditionally where the Spanish speaking community lives and west of Broadway is, the tr is traditionally where families that predominantly speak English live. The city has grown up around this farmhouse and the half acre park that remains of what was vast farmland and 70% of our community are Spanish speaking and to be accessible to our community, all services and labels are offered bilingually. Uh, Slide eight has an image of a keyboard with a large green button reading social media marketing. The title of the slide says going from personal to business and the bullet points read managing expectations from supervisors, Hootsuite, social media marketing for dummies, peer groups and Google. No, really. When I first came to the Dykeman Farmhouse, the posting to their Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter was pretty minimal and inconsistent because there simply was not the staff to go through the time-consuming process of content creation and scheduling posts. The job was handed to me and immediately I had no idea what to do. I had my own Facebook account and no Instagram and no Twitter, and honestly, Twitter remains my least favorite platform. Um, the following on Facebook was about 1,300, Instagram about 300, and Twitter about 90. Um, today our following on Facebook is about 3,900, Instagram 2,600, and Twitter 1,100. In addition, we have added a LinkedIn profile and a YouTube page and are working to grow our following there. How do you go from using an app to keep up with family and friends to managing multiple social media platforms for a company? My advice is to take it one step at a time. The first thing I did was manage my superior's expectations. Uh, I let my superiors know that this was a learning curve for me and to be patient while I learned the ropes. Then I set out to find anything I could that had to do with social media. I took a course I found through Hootsuite, which cost about $100, where I learned how to create a social media strategy document that would guide me through creating content. I bought a book, Social Media Marketing for Dummies. Um, it really helped me understand the differences between the different platforms and how to use them effectively. I joined multiple Facebook groups. Heads up, my favorite one is the Museum Social Media Managers Group. And if you haven't joined, do it right now. No, really, I'll wait. It's important. It has saved my life more than once. And of course, when in doubt, Google it. I started with every free and cheap resource that I could. Google and peer advice are always free. Um, so I took advantage of that. At first I could not afford a scheduling program. So I just used an Excel sheet to put all my content in. Uh, and then when it was time to post, all my content was ready. Copy and paste, it can't get easier, right? Slide nine is titled Luna and shows three images of the stuffed lamb. From left to right, the first is a quad of photo photos of Luna, the lamb, dressed up for each social media platform, glasses and a computer for LinkedIn, a scarf and knitting supplies for Facebook, a tiara for Instagram, and a skimpy red bikini for Tinder. The second image is of Luna looking out of the top of the little red lighthouse, which is located under the George Washington Bridge. And the third image is of a Luna eclipse. 
which shows four images, each of which shows a little less of the lamb until she has completely disappeared. Now that I had a plan, a schedule, and some peer support, I found myself stuck. How do you make his history enjoyable for the masses? I mean, I love history, um, but not everybody does. They find it dry, boring, and frankly, exclusive. In the words of Mary Poppins, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. I needed some sugar to deliver the history. I thought to myself, well, what does the internet love? The internet loves animals. No one with half a heart can resist the cute or funny animal videos. So I thought, why not have an animal? We are a farm, it makes sense. Uh, but sadly, we're in Manhattan and there's a lot of rules against that. Uh, so I bought a stuffed lamb online and had a contest for the community members to name her. I now introduce you to Luna Von Sheepman, a perfect name to represent our neighborhood dynamic. Luna has traveled the neighborhood and the city to introduce our audience to the history of Inwood and its place in the larger context of New York City history. Engagement shot up and our following grew and for the price of a $35 stuffed animal. Luna even made it on New York One, our local uh, news station, when one of the reporters saw her on Twitter and uh, thought she was real and just had to come check her out. Slide 10 is titled Cha-Cha-Cha Changes. There are four images, one of Bernie Sanders sitting in a folding chair with his knitted mittens on the front porch of the farmhouse. The two on the upper right are of DFM educator Fabiola Cazeres talking into the camera of my personal phone with a table of food in front of her. And the last photo is an image shot from an angle above a flat surface and shows hands drawing on strips of paper. If one thing is true about life is that change is constant. And so it is true for social media. From changing, from changes in who is moving to what platform to changes in our social consciousness, keeping up can seem daunting. All the kids moved to TikTok. And I don't know if you remember what I said in the beginning of this presentation, but this is not my only job and I do not have time to create videos every day. It's important to weigh your options. And while TikTok is my, my personal favorite platform, uh, it's just not something that fits our organization at the moment. And that's okay. Uh, we can still reach our audience without stretching ourselves too thin. We have achieved this through upping our meme game on Instagram. Whenever there's an opportunity to turn Luna into a meme or put Bernie Sanders on our front porch, you can bet we're going to do it because history import is important, but so is having fun and relating to your audience. Like every other museum, the pandemic threw our organization for a loop. I think for the first few weeks of lockdown, we met online and just sat looking stunned at each other. We're an organization that never sits still and now we were forced to go nowhere. Luna was keeping the museum safe, but that meant no more Luna posts. And after a few stunned weeks, we kicked it into high gear and started experimenting with virtual programs. Just a few small things came out at first and we did a whole day's worth of posts for Earth Day that included recycle crafts you can do with toilet paper rolls and making lanterns from tin cans. I was using my personal phone to record and I didn't even own a tripod. So I used two stacks of books with two rulers on top um, to hold my phone for an overhead shot. It was a really scrappy time. Thanks to a lot of grant support, we now have tripods and better cameras, but you don't have to have a lot of money to make something good, just a commitment to trying something and not being afraid to fail. Slide 11 shows an image of the front and back of a black t-shirt that reads Hannah and Gilbert and Francis and Harry and Will. On the back it reads, say their names, Dykeman Farmhouse Museum. Text beside the t-shirt reads limited edition t-shirt highlighting the enslaved and freed people that lived and worked on the Dykeman Farm. Being on TikTok and YouTube in my personal time made me aware of the potential for new income streams through personalized merch stores. So I designed this shirt and had help designing a few others 
And now the museum is a neighborhood influencer. And these shirts are popping up everywhere and just spreading the word for us. Interestingly enough, it doesn't cost anything. You create the design, upload it on the products you want, and then start counting the income and the engagement. Slide 12 is titled, Build Your Network. It shows three images. Left to right, they are Fordham University, Morris Jamel Mansion, and the New York Public Library. My last piece of advice for small museums is to build your network to support your social media plan. It is often free or low cost, allows you to increase your reach and you will learn a lot. For example, at the museum, we have developed a relationship with Fordham University, who has a cultural internship program. This program pays Fordham students to intern at cultural institutions around the city. At Dykeman, we are committed to paying interns, but we cannot always afford them. So this has been a huge help. Through Fordham's communications department, we have hosted five interns in the past year, whose focus has been public relations, social media, and digital uh, development communications. Having an intern each semester has brought in fresh ideas for social media posts, merch ideas, and new social, ca social uh, campaign ideas. It has also allowed staff to focus on other important tasks. Our interns leave with real world experience that looks great on their portfolio. So the, the relationship is mutually beneficial. It is free of cost to scroll through your feed and see what's going on in your neighborhood as well. Getting to know your local influencers, collaborate with them on new and fresh content, get to know other businesses and nonprofits and collaborate on social media takeover in areas that your missions overlap. For example, the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum did a social media takeover with the historic house in Washington Heights, the neighborhood just south of Inwood. This brought a new audience to the museum that was already interested in historic sites and were close enough to come visit and engage with our content. Another great potential partner for museums is your local library. The Dykeman Farmhouse Museum partners with the Inwood branch of the New York Public Library on virtual programming all the time. And they share some of our social media content with their audience, which has bolstered our social media and our following. The last slide shows the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum logo and our website and social media handles. I hope you have enjoyed the presentation today. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you will fo follow us on your preferred platform. Our social media handles are Instagram at Dykeman Farmhouse, Facebook at Dykeman Farmhouse Museum, Twitter at Dykeman Farm, LinkedIn you, and YouTube at Dykeman Farmhouse Museum, and our website is www.dykemanfarmhouse.org. Thank you. And now I will hand it over to Emily. Great, thank you so much, Melissa. It's so interesting hearing how someone else runs their social media. My name is Emily Stone and I am the naturalist and education director at the Cable Natural History Museum. I use she, her pronouns and I am a white female with short curly brown hair, a gray headband and a gray flannel shirt. I'm sitting in my messy office with images of ravens, foxes, birds and kids on bulletin boards behind me. I would like to acknowledge that the Cable Natural History Museum is located on the ceded territories and traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and Ocheti Shakawin people who have stewarded this land for generations. So I've been at the Cable Natural History Museum for 11 years, and it really is the, the perfect job for me. I was a nature kid. My dad was a nature writer and photographer for the Des Moines Register, and um, I am a naturalist in every sense of the word. So I'm really happy to be here. And today I'm going to share some of the museum's most fun and successful social media posts. Um, we're on Facebook and Instagram, and I spend only about one to two hours on social media um, per week for work. You can go ahead and put up my slides now. Great. 
So this first slide shows a picture of the Cable Natural History Museum. It's a creamy stone building. There's a large rectangular tower and on the front of that is our blue Mysteries of the Night exhibit banner. The roof line is green and layered like the, the boughs of an evergreen tree. And there is a, a stainless steel statue of a dragonfly in our front yard. So the Cable Natural History Museum our mission is connecting people to Northwoods nature through educational experiences that inspire wonder, discovery, and responsibility. So we are a private nonprofit. We hardly get any um, public money except from a few grants. And we have five full-time employees, pretty big for our small town. Four of us share social media duties and our director um, <laughs> won't touch it with a 10 foot pole, um, but that's okay. So we're in a town of about 828 people. We are very rural. Um, the town of Cable is, um, is also the kind of the center hub of, of social activities for a lot of people who live in the woods. So we are in vacation land. It is northern Wisconsin, lots of national forests, lots of lakes. We have a lot of tourism um, in the summer for fishing, in the winter for skiing, mountain biking, um, lots of cool stuff to do here. So as a museum, we build our own annual exhibits, and we're pretty proud of that. Um, we do lots of summer programs. Um, in a normal year, it was um, like 150 summer programs. Uh, one of those is our Junior Naturalist Day Camp. We also work with the statewide Master Naturalist Program, and we do school visits during the school year as well. So that's us in a nutshell. And one of the best things about being a natural history museum in the middle of the woods is that nature is in our collection. We don't have to stick with just the objects and artifacts that are here inside the museum. Anything is game. So this was a video from a social media post last spring. I'll play it for you. So those are a pair of sandhill cranes, tall gray birds with red foreheads, and they were dancing and displaying in a small um, wetland near my house. And it's pretty thrilling to hear their, their croaking calls. They kind of sound like dinosaurs. And so this was the second most popular video on Instagram in the past year, which is one reason I was sharing it with you. And it was just a simple post about the cranes are back and listening to them and watching them um, display. So this is an example of how any, anything outdoors is game for us to use in our social media, to use to, to um, fulfill our mission. And that's a really fun part of being a natural history museum and of me being a naturalist here. Um, so we're in the middle of uh, 1.5 million acres of national forest. And I actually live in the museum staff house, which is right on the edge of that national forest. So I have endless access to nature. And in fact, this video, um, I spotted the crane on my drive home from work one day. And I just always have a camera with me um, in case of this. That's part of having a father who is a photographer. It was so annoying when I was a kid and now it's what I do. And the camera I use is a Nikon Coolpix um, that we bought with grant money several years ago now, so long ago, the camera is now falling apart. But by having it always with me, I'm able to capture moments like this and then sometimes they can be really successful in social media. Um, so there's also a little thumbnail on the side here that says the reach of this post on um, Facebook was 10.3 thousand people, which is pretty darn good for us. So um, this next slide shows, um, gosh, how do I even describe it? So it's a rainbow of frog names and they are staggered by season. It's titled Northwoods Frog Call Phenology and the months March, April, May, June, July, and August are represented. Let me just um, play this for you. Okay. 
So as a, as a dark blue line went across the screen, you got to hear um, several different frog calls that are common to this area. Oops. I didn't mean for it to play again. <laughs> so this video um, went as viral as anything we've ever done. Um, we did post it to both Facebook and Instagram, um, and we got lots of views and requests from other organizations to use, lots of really great comments about how people love hearing the frogs. We uploaded it to our YouTube channel to make it easy for educational partners to embed it on their websites. And I created it just using audio tracks from the exhibit, the Mysteries of the Night exhibit that I was building at the time. And I used Audacity, um, a free audio editor to create the soundtrack. And then I um, put that into PowerPoint um, for video. So using a really simple PowerPoint animation. Um, and the whole idea was inspired by our first grade museum mobile school program lesson titled Frog Chorus. And as fun as this uh, video is, it's far more fun to do this same thing with first graders in a classroom. Um, but the best thing about this is that it really applied our mission of teaching people about Northwoods nature to a really wide area. You know, we were getting comments from people out east too. So it's neat to be able to spread the word. And I did post this to my personal account first as I was testing it out and it got a lot of exciting responses there. So I knew it was going to be big when it went on to the museum's Facebook page. And that's something I do occasionally. Um, I'll post a picture or something on my personal accounts to test it out to see if people are interested. And if it does really well, then I'll cross post it to the museum's um, social media too. So here is another example of a different type of post. Um, what you're seeing is a screenshot from the back end of Facebook where you can see the slides showing lawns and the sign um, saying no mow may, and then all the performance statistics for our post. So I'm, I'm calling this a timely topic tag along um, because we tagged along to no mow may. Um, which is something that quite a few organizations were posting about this spring. So Haley created it. Um, she was just inspired one day at work to go out and take pictures of bees. She took these photos um, specifically for our post and then put the captions on the photos directly to encourage people to actually click through them. So she created it using Microsoft Publisher, which we use for designing exhibits and everything too. Um, and she used exhibit information learned um, during a past exhibit design. We did an exhibit about bees and one about pollinators in the past few years. And what was great about this is that there was really expanded reach due to shares um, by like-minded groups. A lot of people were posting about like-minded um, or about <laughs> Nomo May um, in the spring. And it was just a, a fun topic that really um, spoke to our, our members and our followers. So my next post is uh, an event post that we boosted. So we don't do this very often, um, but we also don't hold back if there's an event we really want to do well. So you can see the, the um, picture for the event is uh, just the smile of a woman holding a little warbler. It's a chestnut sided warbler with a yellow head and some black markings on his little face. And so I took that picture um, using a photo from a, a previous year's event. And Molly um, actually has a, a, a project in Canva, which is a really nice design website, where she can put the, the title of the event and the date and everything right on top of the picture. So does well for our Facebook banners for events. Um, and the, the title of the program is Bird Banding in the Makwa Barrens, which is the natural area near the museum. So this was created by Molly, and this is one way we um, split up our duties. So Molly is our curator, and she's also in charge of creating our, um, our Facebook events and generally managing the Facebook account, where I take charge more of Instagram. But we all help with everything. Um, and we boosted this particular event as an ad because I had expected it to be really um, interesting and and there was low registration that I figured was because people just didn't know about it yet and hadn't noticed it. So um, we did spend um, $22 on the on the bump 
and also posted it at the top of our weekly e-newsletter, I went back and looked at the people who actually registered and they were all members who probably saw it in our, our e-newsletter instead. So um, the, this slide is a picture, a staff picture, five women in our collections room. So we're all um, posed around a full size mount of a buck deer with big antlers and there's a shelf of ducks behind us. Um, and you know, this is our, our dream team of five women running the Cable Natural History Museum. And I created this post as part of the hashtag Museum 30 um, month of posts. So there, um, someone comes up with these 30 post prompts and they really help inspire creativity. It's fun to use those um, to post about stuff we wouldn't normally post about. And we can still use those different posts um, to tell our story. And it was fun to figure out ways to do that. Um, this hashtag actually increased our reach by 17.6% on Facebook, which was fun to see. And one reason that I put up this particular Museum 30 post um, is that staff photos tend to do really well for us on social media. I think part of that is because people like seeing smiling faces, also because we're really integrated into our community and have a really strong emotional connection with our neighbors and our members and our followers. And so, you know, it's, it's just something that it's easy to like. So um, we don't do it too often, but when we do post a staff photo, it always gets good engagement. This next slide um, shows a post and the picture is a canoe with a canoe paddle and it's on a glassy calm lake with evergreen trees in the distance. And this post um, is part of my Natural Connections series. So I write the weekly Natural Connections newspaper article, which are also posted as um, blog posts and podcasts, and we use social media to announce those and promote those. So on this particular week, um, oh, and one of the ways that we use these posts to connect to our website and to our content is that I, we've created our own um, link tree for use with Instagram. So we can say, you know, find it at the link in our profile. And the link in our profile actually just takes us to this um, otherwise hidden page on our website that has buttons with common things that we tell people to link to from our social media accounts. So my blog and my podcast are, are buttons on that link tree. And we didn't require a special service to create that. Um, on this particular Natural Connections post, the topic of my article was a trip to the Boundary Waters um, Canoe Area Wilderness in northern Minnesota. And um, I used the hashtag Boundary Waters with that, and that really increased our reach. I didn't even really think about it. I mean, hashtags are a good idea, um, but it reached 711 accounts and 74% of those weren't following us. And so that particular hashtag was just really successful and got a, a wider um, viewership. And one nice thing too about our Natural Connections posts and articles in general is that we do have many readers who want to meet the author of that column, which is me, and that equals boots through the door. And that's our ultimate goal of social media is having people actually come visit the exhibit. So here are my two books, compilations of those newspaper columns, Natural Connections 1 and Natural Connections 2. Um, and their collections of nature essays. Um, if you want to find out more about those or any of my other posts, you can go to our website, um, cablemuseum.org slash connect. So um, just like I post my natural connections column every Friday morning, um, each of us naturalists writes a blog and we each have our own day to post. So um, this is a, a picture of an, a male American kestrel, so a small raptor. Um, and this is a blog repost. So Haley, our naturalist, created it using an iPhone video, and it ties into her weekly blog and e-newsletter content. So her designated posting day um, is on Saturday mornings. And so she posts about our living collections. So our birds and our snakes, our salamander. Um, and this in particular is Aldo the American Kestrel. He's so handsome. 
All right, and this is the last type of post I wanted to share with you. So the picture is of two little goslings, yellow um, baby geese, and they have their mouths wide open like they're squawking. Um, and so this post was to announce our um, photo contest where the People's Choice Awards were being run on Facebook. And so, um, you know, I share some of the numbers here on the side, but really, um, you know, the details of the photo contest are pretty fun. So um, we did on the entry form, we included a waiver with strong wording so people would know for sure that their photos would be posted on social media, potentially forever and ever. Um, and we had one professional judge to, to judge half the contest. And then we did the People's Choice Awards on Facebook where the public could vote. So um, liking a photo got at one point and commenting on it got at two points. And that really increased engagement too. And photographers were encouraged to share the posts with their friends in order to get votes. And that also increased our reach. And we used Instagram stories to drive traffic to Facebook because Instagram doesn't have the same type of engagement to allow voting there. So here is another one of the posts from the photo contest. So this is our championship round. And so there's a grid with four photos. The top photo is a lily pad with um, several baby snapping turtles on it and see if you can find how many, or maybe they're painted turtles, how many painted turtles you can see there. Um, the lower left picture is of a common loon adult feeding its fuzzy brown chick. There's also a doe deer um, with its fawn licking its chin. And then the last photo is of a mama brown bear and three club cubs climbing a tree. So we really had a lot of fun with this. Um, and I also used, um, Instagram stories to help drive traffic to our Facebook page. So here's a logo of the Northwoods Babies photo contest, pink and green and bright colors. The center picture is one of the entries. And then I grabbed a screenshot of the Facebook comments that were pretty fun. So one of the comments, it's a little fawn hiding in the grass. And one comment is peekaboo. Another comment is I bet you can't see me. Um, and this is a textbook example of camouflage. And then the last photo is of a mama deer um, licking her fawn. And the fawn is just scrunching up its eyes like it's unhappy. And one of the commenters said, that's exactly how my daughter reacts when I try to wipe something off her face. And so I just thought that was really cute and thought other people would too. So encouraging people to like and comment and visit our Facebook. So you can take my slides down now. That's all I wanted to share with you, but um, it is time to open it up to questions. All right. Thank you, that was great. And as someone that, um, you know, also for my organization, very small staff of two, um, I was listening to, <laughs> to all the different um, advice on on the, the different platforms. So we have some questions that have come in. Hold on, let me just grab them up here. First of all, this is really to both of you. Do you ever pay to boost posts or run ads on Instagram or Facebook? Um, I, I guess I can speak to that. Uh, yes, uh, we do, um, though we're very selective about it. Generally, um, we only do that when we have a big event that we're trying to drive people towards. Emily? Yeah, that's the same for us. Mostly, um, it'll be a post about an event that we um, are scheduling at the last minute. Sometimes, sometimes we're spontaneous in what we do. And also if it's a event that we thought was gonna get a lot higher engagement and hasn't yet through our regular channels. Okay. Yeah, budget becomes an issue, right, too. <laughs> and, thank, and thank you both for sort of commenting and how much time you spend on social media per month. It's good, or per week. To, it's, it's good to put it in perspective for everyone. Um, Emily, this one's specifically for you. Uh, when others asked for permission to use your frog chorus video, how did you give them permission? Was it a text chat exchange or on the social media platform? Or did you send something official? Any concerns about extending the rights to others? 
Um, we, however, they asked me, I just replied. Um, we're pretty easy going about that type of thing. Um, you know, with my natural connections articles, even we, we give those away for free to people. Um, so, you know, I was a little hesitant, but also didn't, didn't have an easy way to manage any other way of giving permission or, or rights to the frog video. And honestly, you know, it's on social media, it's on YouTube and people really can use it however they want. There's not an easy way for us to restrict it. So we just let it go. Okay. And then before we go too far in a different direction of topics, um, have either of you ever utilized Google ad grants? It's something we're in the process of doing right now. Um, we uh, we just um, switched everything over to Google for nonprofits. Um, so we are in the process of applying for the grants. Um, but I, as I understand it, you might want someone to help you manage that because it can be quite a lot. Absolutely. Um, so Emily, you mentioned uh, testing out posts on your personal account, and then Melissa and I were sort of chatting about, um, you know, the fact that they have a private account to, to test. So I'm going to ask both of you this question. Have you ever tested a post on these accounts that failed and thus never posted it on the museum's page? Um. You know, I guess, I guess so. I mean, if I post something on my personal page and it, it doesn't do anything exciting, then I won't post it on the museum's page. I'm not always directly thinking of that connection because I'm a naturalist and the museum is a natural history museum. There, it's, it's all blended. Like the type of content I post on my personal is very similar. So only if something really go, is exciting on my personal page would I consider put, um, transferring it to the museum's page. Okay. Um, I don't really post things to my personal page prior to putting them on on our business page. Um, but what I do have is a private um, uh, Facebook group um, specifically for our museum to test lives, to uh, communicate about, um, you know, the different digital content that we're working on for Facebook. Um, so I can test a live there. That was my big scary moment was like, I'm going to go live on Facebook for the first <laughs> time and it's going to be on, you know, the business account. I'm going to screw it up. And um, so I created the Facebook group so that we could all go in that group. And then if it was like a hot mess, it didn't matter because nobody was going to see it. And, and that made, you know, the first time we went live go a lot smoother. Yeah, I love that. I still haven't done a Facebook Live on behalf of our organization. <laughs> I tend to just keep it. It's on a scary Zoom. moment. It's a scary no, moment. No, but, but I've attended plenty of them as you know and enjoy the the interaction and the likes floating up and all that stuff. So I I see the value. Um, so this next one is for both of you, and it's kind of going back to our last module, which was about audiences and analytics. Um, this this person would like to hear more about how you measure the impact of your social media. Are you looking for outcomes beyond the likes, shares, and follows that are standard measurements in the social media platforms, or is that sort of just your baseline? <laughs> we, Go ahead. Okay. We, we aren't very um, systematic about it, I would say. So, you know, I'll, I'll pay attention when I post um, does really well, um, and that come, you know, I get notified of interactions and stuff that'll tell me it's doing really well. Otherwise, we do just really hope, um, you know, it, with a, an event post, we hope that people will register for the event. Or um, with the photo contest post, I was really happy with how many people were engaging with that, and we got lots of votes from people. So it's really specific to the different types of posts, and we we don't have any um, formal goals or formal way of of measuring anything. Um, we're happy with whatever we can get, and we're not willing to put a whole lot more time and effort into really upping our game. Lisa. Oh, I think she might have frozen. Uh-oh. Because she well, just, has a much more organized answer. 
<laughs> well, just uh, sort of a part two of that question. When you report your social media um, numbers, have you figured out how to aggregate social media stats for a unified number, or do you always report them individually since each platform measures engagements differently? So we, we don't actually report. The board doesn't care all that much um, <laughs> on, our, on our numbers. The one I did report on was the, the frog phonology video that went viral. So I was really excited to share the numbers with that. But otherwise, um, we're happy just coasting along um, as we are. And the board is more interested in, in other types of our work. OK. Well, hopefully Melissa will come back on and <laughs> join us when she can. Um, here's an interesting Sting one that uh, we'll, we'll see what you do with this. How quickly do you respond to current events? Do you respond to current events? It depends on the current event. Um, we don't always. Um, we, as a museum, we try to be very neutral and stay out of any issues that might be somewhat controversial. Um, so we we don't do that much with current events. I know with the the Bernie meme, I was happy to see Bernie in his folding chair with the mittens. Um, I don't remember if we posted that to social, but I did use a slide of him in a slideshow right away after that all happened. So, um, but our nature is that we don't do that much with current events. Okay, Melissa, you're back. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I parts internet decided to just go out for no reason. Sorry. That's okay. Just glad to see you back. Well, what do you, do you have a comment on this? Do you respond to current events or, or do you have a sort of a policy on that? It's a hot, hot button topic. And I know that museum social media managers page is a great resource for help there. We have a couple of policies. One, if there's any big event, we come together as a team and decide how we're going to address it. And we do that, you know, it's usually like an emergency meeting. I know that um, in the beginning of the pandemic and when, um, you know, George Floyd things and, and things kept happening, we came out, you know, with a, with a statement and um, have followed that up with um, action. Here's how we are uh, we are actively addressing what we said in the statement. And um, uh, you know, uh, as far as policies go, we don't have a hard and fast policy. Other than we don't um, acknowledge trolls. Um, that's <laughs> that's the big thing. Is sometimes we get people and that have you know mean and awful things to say, and we just ignore them rather than fuel the fire. Yeah, that's a hard one. And I see the, you know, the discussion go back and forth on, on that all the time. Um, it's just the age we're living in right now. Everybody wants to comment on everything. Um, here's one that just came in. How many of your posts are scheduled in advance or pre-planned versus content that is sort of posted on the fly? That's a good, I'm, I'm interested in this one too. <laughs> Um, for us, I, I would guess that about, well, at least right now, about two thirds of our posts are scheduled ahead using Facebook Business Manager, and maybe another third are, are posted in the moment. Um, that's a guess. I would say for us right now, 75% are scheduled. Um, you know, we always have some last minute stuff come up and well, we may already have a scheduled post that day, but we'll make up a post anyway. Um, if something comes up or if something cool is happening at the museum that um, wasn't expected, then, um, you know, one of us is here to take a picture of it. We'll send it to whoever's working on social media that day and get it up um, pretty quickly. <clears throat> yeah, that's the same for us. Most of ours are scheduled, but then sometimes, again, this is where that overlap between personal accounts or personal social media use and then business, I'll just be on there doing my scroll and I'll see something that, well, I should share this with SEMC. And so, so, but then I, I'm always worried that the other, my other staff member who's doing social media, I'm going to like preempt one of her scheduled posts. So it really is a little bit of a complicated dance with the on the fly. You know, sometimes when I'm doing an on the fly post, I'll actually schedule it for an hour out and that okay. way, we don't step on each other's toes because you can look at the scheduled posts. It's very smart. <laughs> See, I've just learned new. 
Um, well, we're, we're getting to the end and um, there's been some great questions, I guess, from each of you, a final thought on a best, a best practice you might convey for creating content for a social media platform. Hmm. You know, from our perspective, it's to have fun with it too. I mean, the more fun we're having with pictures of nature happenings at the museum, the more engaged our audience is going to be. And that's also just our nature as an organization. We tend to be um, a little less organized and less scripted, and it tends to work out for us. So have fun with it. Thank you. I, honestly, that's my answer too. I, I, <laughs> I, I think that it, that comes through in your content when you're having fun with it. It comes through people um, engage more with that when you are just enjoying yourself. People definitely feel that and, um, and then want to engage um, with you because they enjoy it. I agree. I posted something last week. It was people that looked like art in art museums. And I just thought it was such a funny post, but it was, I don't know, it was engaging and it made me laugh. So I'm like, well, I'm going to post it and see what happens. Um, but I, I completely agree. And I just want to thank you both for the, the time that you've put into um, sharing your experiences on how small museums can use social media in these creative and engaging ways. Um, really appreciate it. And um, thank you. That's, that's the end of our presentation. So just a few final reminders for all of you who have joined us today. Um, if you did enjoy this program, please do us a favor and share it with your network. We really appreciate participation and we hope to see you at future programs. And also just stay tuned to museum-hub.org for more information on our upcoming events. Um, so just a few more reminders. Remember to visit the forum on the website and ask any additional questions. Follow our social media channels. And finally, please join us for the first technical training session of Module 9. Um, this will feature Lori Bird McDevitt, who is the co-founder of 1909 Digital in Indianapolis, Indiana. And she's going to focus very specifically on building a simple social media strategy. Um, so thank you all for attending today's session. I've enjoyed being your host, and I hope that everybody has a fabulous day. Bye.